what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about um, fuel cells from a thermodynamic perspective. So, and that basically comes down to thinking about the equilibrium potential for um, fuel cells and where, where the efficiency of fuel cells comes from. Last time um, we were talking about voltages and currents and hopefully I convinced you that um, the potential, when we think of a piece of metal having a certain potential and potential differences between metals, corresponds to a difference in chemical potential of electrons. And so that sort of comes back to the way we traditionally think about things in chemical engineering. Um, so what I wanted to kind of expand on that today was what is the amount of, of, of work potential we should theoretically be able to get out of a fuel cell reaction? And how do we think about that? And how do we relate that to voltages that we might measure? So as a working example, um, one of the things I was trying to draw a comparison to was combustion. So imagine we took uh, methane, which is the principal con constituent of, of natural gas. A lot of electrical power plants are, are run from burning natural gas. How does that work? Well, we take the natural gas and we react uh, with oxygen in the air. And this produces CO2 and water as products. And that releases a ton of thermal energy uh, as a flame or, or catalytic combustion. We can do this and it's going to create a lot of thermal energy that we can try to capture and convert some of that into, into work. And the way that works is if we look at the chemical potential of methane um, plus two times the chemical potential of oxygen, those two chemical potentials as a group added up are much, much, much greater than the chemical potential of CO2 and the chemical potential of water. And that difference is about 800 kilojoules per mole, which we'll come back to in a second. So if we just take these materials and mix them together, methane and oxygen, what this is saying is that there's a huge thermodynamic driving force for these molecules to react. And, and it's gonna go to completion. Basically, if we have oxygen and methane around, they're just going to just incinerate each other instantly, uh, assume, assuming we have the rates, the necessary catalytic rates or homogeneous reaction rates in the gas to, to support it, they will want to become CO2 and water thermodynamically. It also tells us that this reaction is incredibly far from equilibrium. And as we were talking about last time, it means that there's going to be a huge amount of entropy generation when it occurs, if it occurs in a spontaneous way, as it would whenever we combust. So it's far from equilibrium. And S gen is much, much greater than zero uh, if, we, if we do it as combustion. So one of the things we talked about in 325 is the idea that if you, if you have some process and you allow it to occur in a continuous state of equilibrium, then we can eliminate the entropy generation, right? So this is essentially the question. Can we take a highly, highly out of equilibrium process like combustion and somehow conduct it in an equilibrium way? so that we don't have this entropy generation. And that, in, a, in the essence, is, is the idea behind a fuel cell. Um, and the way that's done is to decouple two parts of this reaction. And I'm going to use the SOFC example because it's the one I'm most familiar with. But the basic idea is we have a membrane. This is a ceramic membrane. It's dense, and that's important because we don't want the gases to mix. Basically, we want to keep the methane and the oxygen apart. Um, 
And on one side, we put air. And on that side, we allow an electrochemical reaction to take place where we're taking oxygen molecules and we're setting them in equilibrium with ions, which exist in this solid material. So within this membrane, it's, it's a dense solid membrane, but the temperature is high enough that the ions within the structure of the ceramic material are mobile, mobile enough they can move around under a driving force. So inside the ceramic, we have mobile O2 minus ions. And we can, at this one electrode, we have an electrode on this side. We're, we're supplying electrons. And because of the supply of electrons, we can reduce the O2 to O2 minus and then the cur current, so the, so the flow of charge, you have negative flow of electrons. Electrons are flowing into the electrode. You're forming O2 minus ions and the ions are then going through the membrane. You can also go the other way. I could have ions coming through this way and releasing oxygen and forming electrons, which then go off through the wire. And that process hopefully is somewhere close to equilibrium. And then on the other side, we have another electrode, different electrode, doesn't have to be the same type of electrode. But at this other electrode, we're going to again react with the methane or some other fuel. So CH4, if I take four oxygen ions, um, I can use that to form CO2 and water and eight electrons. This is an eight electron process. I reduce two oxygen molecules that involves eight electrons, or I can oxidize one methane molecule to a CO2 and two waters that also equivalently requires eight electrons. So imagine we were doing this continuously, feeding in electrons at the top. So eight electrons are going this way, and then we're removing them at the bottom, eight electrons are going that way. And then that's going through an external circuit. So at equilibrium, nothing is going in either direction where we can go in either direction. And that would describe an equilibrium state for our whole system. And so if we move the system a little bit one way, pump electrons in one direction or pump electrons in the other direction, we can make this reaction proceed in either direction, either toward CO2 and water or backwards toward methane uh, and oxygen um, and we can do that in a continuous state of equilibrium. So that's the sort of magical part of a fuel cell is where we're taking this one reaction that's highly out of equilibrium and we're splitting it apart into two sub, sub reactions or half reactions, which hopefully remain very close to equilibrium. And that sounds a little bit like, you know, well, how can you do that? The, the difference is that because we've put them at two different electrodes, those electrodes are different potentials. The electrons don't have the same energy content at the two sides of the cell. And so those two half cell reactions can be in equilibrium. And we're maintaining them, we're, ma we're maintaining the separation of that energy uh, through the voltage. So what we can do is we can take this and we can analyze it just like you would any other chemical reaction, thinking about equilibrium of chemical potentials and go through and try to relate that to the voltage of the cell. And that's what I'm gonna do. So, Imagine we're taking the cell and we're holding it at equilibrium, and then we measure a voltage at, this, at the terminals. Um, what, is, what is the value of this voltage if we're in a state of equilibrium? Okay, so I think we can work that out sort of like any other type of chemical reaction. If we think about each of these steps being in equilibrium, we could set the chemical potentials on each side, of each reaction to equal each other, just like you would a chemical reaction. And we should be able to work that out. And that's the idea. So, so first of all, I'm going to label these electrodes to keep it clear. I'm going to call this one the cathode. And this one I'm going to call the anode. And um, I'll come back in a bit to the nomenclature of why we call it the anode and the cathode. In brief, it means that it's because the uh, under fuel cell mode, we're, we're reducing uh, oxygen at the cathode 
And that's the definition of, a, of cathodic or anodic reaction is whether it's oxidizing or reducing. Um, at equilibrium though, we're not going in either particular direction. So it's really more of a label than anything else to just keep it straight. So for, mo for the moment, just think about the cathode as the oxygen electrode, the anode is the fuel side electrode, and that's how I'm labeling it. Okay, so with that labeling, we would say that at equilibrium, um, we have the chemical potential of methane um, at the anode. So I'm going to use superscript to indicate which electrode I'm talking about. Um, plus four mu O2 minus at the anode. That has to equal mu CO2 at the anode plus two mu H2O at the anode plus eight mu electron at the anode, just by definition. And then if the cathode is also in equilibrium, we would say the same, write a similar statement there. So we'd have two mu O2 at the cathode plus eight mu uh, electrons at the cathode that has to equal four times mu O uh, two minus. And just to be clear, um, because the, we have two different electrodes, the chemical potentials at the two electrodes of, of, the, of the same species, like O2 minus or E minus or any other gas concentrate or uh, any of the gases, those chemical potentials might not be the same at the two electrodes. And so I'm, for the moment, I'm just treating them as separate variables. Um, okay, so we know voltage is related to the chemical potential of the electrons. If I just point that out, that's here and that's here. So if I want to isolate that, we can rearrange these. Um, and so we would say that mu E at the cathode minus mu E at the anode, that's gonna be related to the voltage difference between the two electrodes. That quantity is gonna equal one eighth because we're dividing by eight, I'm gonna divide both equations by eight and then rearrange. So if I divide by eight, then I can isolate mu E at the anode and then cathode. And then we're multiplying that by mu CO2 at the anode plus two mu H2O at the anode minus mu CH4 at the anode minus mu O2 at the cathode. And then there'll be one additional term, which is one half times mu of O2 minus, minus mu O2 minus between the cathode and the anode side. So those, that last term represents the difference in the chemical potential of the ion between the two sides of the membrane. So on one side of the membrane, you might have a different uh, ion chemical potential. Than the other, and so that difference might persist. Okay, so how do we take this? So if you look at this carefully, on the left-hand side we have charged species. We're looking at differences in chemical potential of electrons, and then on the right-hand side you'll notice that we have a group of chemical potentials for neutral species, all molecules. So that doesn't depend on electrical state or voltage or anything like that. And then the last term is an ion chemical potential difference. Those are charged species. So you might expect if you have potential variation throughout the electrolyte, then you would start to see a difference in chemical potential for O2 minus between the anode and the cathode. But remember, we've assumed equilibrium. So if we go back to our sort of picture of what this looks like, we're saying that the anode reaction is in equilibrium. We're also saying the cathode reaction is in equilibrium. I think we're also saying that the membrane transport process, it's easy for ions also to get back and forth because this whole thing is not, there's no finite rate. We're just holding this thing in equilibrium. There's no driving force for ions to move one way or the other across the membrane. So from a trans for the transport part of this, 
which is the movement of the ions across the membrane, that part is also in equilibrium. So if, we, if we're saying everything's in equilibrium, this last term would have to be zero. This is not always true. It's not generally true, but at equilibrium, it would be true. And so that's really our assumptions here. We're saying that that's, that process, in, the transport process in equilibrium, the anode process is in equilibrium. These are all equilibrium statements. Okay, so that last term would drop out. And then we also talked last time about the relationship between potential that you measure with a voltmeter in volts versus chemical potential of electrons. And the relationship is minus times the negative times Faraday's constant. So putting that together, we would have that minus F uh, phi cathode minus phi anode. And this is what I'm gonna call the voltage. This is one half, excuse me, one eighth times this first term, mu CO2 plus mu H2O minus mu CH4 minus two mu O2. What does that look like? What is the difference in chemical potential between all these species? Isn't that the same as the delta G? Right, exactly. So chemical potentials to remind you are all Gibbs free energies. Um, so this is a difference in Gibbs free energy between CO2 and water, which are the products, and CH4 and O2, which are the reactants, right? So this is really just a, a, this just the value of the chemical potential difference uh, or the Gibbs free energy between reactants and products. Or another way to say that, this is delta G of reaction. And if I rearrange this further, and this is at equilibrium. So our final statement here is that V equilibrium is minus delta G of reaction divided by NF, where N equals the number of electrons. And it's the number of electrons per stoichiometric statement. In other words, we've written this reaction as an eight electron process, so N is equal to eight in this case. This equilibrium voltage is also called the reversible cell potential. There are a bunch of different names for this, but V equilibrium or V reversible is also another way people will commonly describe this quantity. And this result, I'm just gonna put a box around it. This is known generally as the Nernst equation. So it's just basically, and you can do this for any electrochemical reaction, any electrochemical cell. You can do a similar analysis where you look at the reactions in equilibrium, you look at all the transport processes in equilibrium, you do the same kind of manipulation and you can derive what the equilibrium voltage would be for that cell um, as in relation to the anode and cathode reactions. Um, and that's called the Nernst equation. 